Well, Damien, thanks for joining us at ADAPT's Security Edge in here in Melbourne. And today's theme is really about the role of the modern security leader in safeguarding business value. When you think about that theme and the issues you're seeing across the areas you're advising on, what does that mean to you? So really when I think about the sector and what we need to do to sort of safeguard information is exactly what ADAPT's doing, which is connecting people, linking the conversations, sharing experiences, because criminals do this all the time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately what happens in, in our sector is everybody says, okay, I'm going to protect my silo and I'm only going to do um, things for my organisation, but I'm not going to share any information with anybody else. And so really the theme of today and sort of connecting with people helps to break down that barrier. Mm -hmm. And it connects with culture as well, doesn't it? And as we talk with our developer community, as we talk with our business community, as we think about what our customers need in terms of the right kinds of frictions, it's getting the right culture. So the right behaviours, but also for the right reasons. As you think about driving some of the conversion that's needed as we address the skill shortage, what are some tips that you can share with the community? So I think some of the biggest tips are really having a program within your organisation to take on graduates and giving you know, people the opportunity to learn the skills that they need, particularly from a cybersecurity perspective. Don't always rely on getting cybersecurity experts through the traditional paths. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know of some great cybersecurity individuals that have come through humanities, uh, music, um, mathematics, uh, basically because that's all data matching and sort of data analytics sort of mm -hmm. aspects. So don't discount those individuals. Uh, I think that's a really critical aspect. Look beyond the individual potentially, you know, in terms of what university or tertiary background they've come from and really look at, you know, do they have the curiosity and the drive to mm -hmm. learn and be part of the business and integrate with the culture that you're trying to establish in your business? Well? Mm -hmm. And that's not so much what the individual has done four or five years ago. It's almost looking at that more recent relevant experience and I like how you've picked out sort of the music piece there as well it's that creativity being able to think of what might be deemed impossible in terms of a potential attack but if you've got that sort of open thinking curiosity asking questions that's going to help you to sort of explore some of the challenges and if you were to suggest perhaps how we can measure and therefore incentivize some of this change. What kind of advice would you share? So my advice would be from a cybersecurity tertiary education perspective, we really need to have some way to rank and rate all these courses that are available. Because if you think about it as a consumer, which cybersecurity course do you enroll in? Mm -hmm. Which one's gonna help you get a career path in software development or consulting from a security perspective or sales from a security or even you know, design and architecture or, you know, leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what's really missing in this piece is a way for consumers to identify which tertiary provider is going to provide that best path and opportunity, which ones are offering the most relevant industry courses, uh, you know, teaching things like we spoke earlier in terms of risk management, understanding the current legislation in Australia, international legislation, particularly around cybersecurity. Mm -hmm and also provide them with hands-on experience. So, you know, some integrated work placement program that helps to guarantee that they're going to get a job. Mm. And that's good for the ecosystem overall because not only do we need to um, grow the pie, if you like, um, of pipeline coming through education all the way from primary, secondary, and then through into that job readiness as well, but it's then also how we bring people from across the organisation and into that kind of almost love of doing security because it has that purpose. And if there was one main challenge that you think that security leaders have a real opportunity to overcome, what would it be? So I think the biggest opportunity is communication. Mm -hmm. because really the role of a size of an organisation is to communicate and bring people on the journey, mm -hmm. get them to buy into the importance and the story behind why security is relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, it, it's one thing for boards to say, yep, you know, we've got security front of mind. Mm-hmm. But the chances are they're probably thinking, oh, this is an IT job. I'll give it to the IT department. Whereas really cybersecurity is everybody's responsibility in an organisation. And so the real role of the CISA is to be that coordinator, conductor almost, facilitator to help the organisation understand that Mm -hmm. and to enable the business to move forward. I think what the sector's been damaged by is in the past we had CISOs or CSOs or leaders where it was cybersecurity was a department of no. Mm -hmm. Rather than being the department that enables the business to move forward with the risk appetite that the business is happy to move forward with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's getting that visibility into where these risks are going to arise, having the language to then communicate, not only with the top management team, but also up to the board of directors, so that when we're making our policy decisions, connecting from operational security teams to the boardroom, but also risk and compliance as well, we're making the right decisions because we've prioritised it in the right way, and it comes through that soft diplomacy. And if there was one last message that you were going to leave with the ADAPT community, what would it be? So being a CISO is very difficult. Um, a cyber breach will happen at some point on their watch. It's going to be one of those moments where if they haven't already experienced it, it's the existent- existential crisis for them, if you like, mm-hmm. of everything going wrong at the same time, uh, their health is going to be impacted, team morale is going to be impacted, uh, you know, the organisation is going to be uh, using them potentially as a scapegoat for the incident. Yeah. And it, it is a time where they will need the support of their other peers in the industry. So, you know, all the relationships that they build here at, at ADAPTS and events like this, they need to make sure that they leverage those, keep them strong. You know, other sizes will know what they're going through. Mm. Uh, and I think it's important that we don't have a blame game. So, you know, when there is a breach, it's not a blame game of, you didn't do the right thing or you didn't defend the organisation. There Mm. are just way too many things that can go wrong and will go wrong. Um, You know, Darren Kane, who's the CSO at um, NBN, you know, talks about when the firefighter goes into a building to save a building, uh, whether they are successful or not, they're still congratulated and said, you know, good job, thank you for being there. We haven't got to that point with cybersecurity. It's too much of a blame game where oh, you're the CISO, you weren't doing your job, so therefore we've got to put the bullet in you and get somebody out. So they almost become the scapegoat. Mm. And I think it's really important for business leaders outside of the CISO community to understand that they're not a scapegoat. You're not going to be able to defend against every single type of attack. It could be a young kid that's using tools from online mm-hmm. all the way through to a foreign government that is intent on getting information because maybe you're just part of a longer chain that they're actually working through for an attack. Mm. So, you know, at the end of the day, you can only do the best you can do as long as you're honest, open, you've had the discussions with the business. Um, You know, reputational risk is something that they all suffer Mm -hmm. uh, because there is this concept that if you are uh, a CISO when a breach happens, um, you know, your reputation as, as an individual individual does take a hit. Mm. And it's that fear and anxiety sometimes that with all the weight of that responsibility, if we're not burden sharing in that way, it can become a bit of a lonely experience. And I think kind of in a way it's taking that commander's intent approach. These are the directions we're going in terms of enabling and providing the right frictions to mitigate risk and those kinds of worries but also knowing that we can't know how the shape of the threat is going to change. It changes every day. Correct, and you can't do everything right once. It's a journey. Um, The business may not have the right level of maturity. It may not have the right level of funding. You may not be able to get the right level of resources. Uh, You know, if I compare banks, some banks have cybersecurity teams that are in the order of between 300 to 700 staff. Mm. If I compare that with the tertiary education sector, you know, some CISOs might have a team of three or four people mm-hmm. to maybe 40 people. Uh, you know, if you compare it to the health sector, money that they get is really invested in beds and patient outcomes. Yeah. So the challenge is how do you then sort of go to the business and say, well, actually, in order to ensure we've got 
safety of patient records, there's a portion of that money that has to come towards safeguarding data. Mm, absolutely. So fundamentally, I think what we've talked about today in our discussion is putting the value against the cost in terms of the role of what security is doing to enable the overall organisation. So, Damien, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.